Chapter 27, Perioperative Care, Timby Fundamentals. Perioperative care, care that clients receive before, during, and after surgery is unique. The current trend is to facilitate as short a perioperative period as possible. This trend is driven by efforts to control health care costs by facilitating the client's return to the comfort and support of his or her home. This chapter discusses the general responsibilities nurses assume when caring for clients during the preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative periods of perioperative care. Chronic health conditions may be present in older adults and may increase the complexity of both the perioperative care, including preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative periods. Preoperative period. The preoperative period starts when clients or their families in an emergency learn that surgery is necessary and ends when clients are transported to the operating room. This period can be short or long, one major factor affecting its length is the urgency with which the surgery must be performed. See Table 27.1. Inpatient surgery. Surgery is performed for various reasons. See Table 27.2. Inpatient surgery is the term used for procedures performed on a client who is admitted to the hospital, expected to remain at least overnight, and in need of nursing care for more than one day after surgery. All except the sickest of clients usually are admitted the morning of the scheduled surgery. Many people who have inpatient surgery undergo prior lab and diagnostic tests. Some have met with anesthesiologists, a physician who administered chemical agents that temporarily eliminate sensation and pain, or an anesthetist, a certified nurse specialist who administers anesthesia under the direction of a physician. Most clients will have received preoperative instructions from either the surgeon's office nurse or hospital nurse. Again, an anesthesiologist is the physician who administers chemical agents that temporarily eliminate sensation and pain. Anesthetist is a nurse specialist who administers anesthesia under the direction of a physician. Outpatient surgery, also called ambulatory surgery and same-day surgery, is the term used for operative procedures performed on clients who return home the same day. It generally is reserved for clients in an optimal state of health whose recovery is expected to be uneventful. Advantages and disadvantages of outpatient surgery are listed in Table 27-4. Outpatient surgical units are located in either a hospital or a separate building that the hospital owns. Others are freestanding, privately owned facilities such as a surgeon's office that is not affiliated with the hospital. The client remains in the location of the surgery for a brief time and is able to return home by mid-afternoon or early evening when the client is awake and alert, vital signs are stable, pain and nausea are controlled, oral fluids are retained, the client voids a sufficient quantity of urine, and the client has received home care instructions. If a complication develops, the client is transferred and admitted to a hospital unit. Outpatients are frequently instructed to take preoperative or routine medications at home before procedures. In review, clients remain in the outpatient surgical suite for a brief time and get discharged by mid-afternoon or early evening. When the client is awake and alert, vital signs are stable, oral fluids are retained, urine output is quantity sufficient, pain and nausea are controlled, and the client has received home care instructions. Outpatient procedures have increased dramatically as a result of advances in techniques such as those using endoscopes, an instrument for performing internal procedures in lieu of those requiring an incision, and lasers, methods of anesthesia, prospective reimbursement, managed care, and changes in Medicare and Medicaid provisions. Laser surgery. This is the acronym LASER stands for Light Amplification by the Stimulated Emission of Radiation. 
Lasers convert a solid gas or liquid into light. When focused, the energy from the light is converted to heat, causing vaporization of tissue and coagulation of blood vessels. Examples include the carbon dioxide laser, the argon laser, the ruby laser, and the yttrium aluminum garnet YAG laser. Laser surgery is used as an alternative to many previously conventional surgical techniques such as reattaching the retina, removing skin tattoos, and revascularizing ischemic heart muscle instead of coronary artery bypass graft surgery. Laser surgery offers the following advantages. Cost effectiveness, reduced need for general anesthesia, smaller incisions, minimal blood loss, reduced swelling, less pain, decreased incidence of wound infections, reduced scarring, and less time recuperating. Laser surgery technology requires unique safety precautions, such as eye, fire, heat, and vapor protection. Depending on the type of laser used, everyone, including the client, wears goggles. In some cases, prescription glasses with side shields are sufficient but contact lenses are not allowed. Because lasers produce heat, fire, and electrical discharge, safety is paramount. Volatile substances such as alcohol and acetone are not used around lasers because of their flammability. Surgical instruments are coated black to avoid absorbing scattered light that causes them to retain heat. Sometimes even the client's teeth are covered with plastic or rubber mouth guard to shield metal dental fillings. For the same reason, no jewelry is allowed. When a laser is used, it releases a plume, a substance composed of vaporized tissue, carbon dioxide, and water that may contain intact cells. Plumes, sometimes referred to as surgical smoke, are accompanied by an offensive odor and for some, burning and itching of the eyes. The latter effects are not hazardous and usually can be reduced with the use of local exhaust ventilators and smoke evacuators. The greater concern involves the consequences of inhaling plumes. Airborne cells in the inhaled plume may contain viruses such as human papillomavirus, HPV, and possibly human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. Although no cases of HIV transmission through lasers have been documented, high-efficiency respirator masks like a fit-tested surgical N95 mask are recommended to reduce the risk for infection transmission. informed consent. Regardless of whether surgery is performed conventionally, endoscopically, or with a laser, clients commonly are fearful and anxious. They often have many questions and preconceived ideas about what surgery involves. Healthcare providers may answer some of these questions. Nevertheless, the physician is responsible for providing information that meets the criteria for informed consent. Permission a client gives after an explanation of the risks, benefits, and alternatives. See Chapter 14. A signed form witnessed by a nurse is evidence that the consent has been obtained, figure 27-1. If an adult client is confused, unconscious, or mentally incompetent, the client's spouse, nearest blood relative, or someone with a durable power of attorney for the client's health care must sign the consent form. If an adult client is under the influence of a mind-altering drug such as a narcotic or is alcohol intoxicated, obtaining consent must be delayed until the drug has been metabolized. In a life-threatening emergency, a court may waive the need to obtain a written or verbal consent from a client who requires immediate surgery on the basis of substituted judgment. That is, the court believes that if the client had the capacity consent, he or she would have done so. Refer to Chapter 14 for the elements that constitute informed consent. If the client is younger than 18, a parent or legal guardian must sign the consent form. In an emergency, healthcare personnel make every effort to obtain consent by telephone, telegram, or fax. Adolescents younger than 18 years, living independently and supporting themselves, are regarded as emancipated minors and may sign their own consent forms. Each nurse must be familiar with agency policies and state laws regarding surgical cons consent forms. Clients must sign the consent form before receiving any preoperative sedatives. When the client or designated person has signed the permit, an adult witness also signs it to indicate that the client or designate signed voluntarily. This witness usually is a member of the health care team or an employee in the admissions department. 
The nurse is responsible for ensuring that all necessary parties have signed the consent form and that it is in the client's chart before the client goes to the operating room. Preoperative blood donation. When the need for a blood transfusion during the perioperative period is anticipated, the low risk for acquiring HIV from a blood transfusion sometimes is discussed before the surgical procedure. Although publicly donated blood is tested for several pathogens, including HIV and hepatitis B, the potential, although slight, for acquiring a blood-borne disease still exists. Therefore, some clients undergoing surgery donate their own blood preoperatively if it is not jeopardizing their own health. Pre-donated blood is held on reserve in the event that the client needs a blood transfusion during or after surgery. Receiving own, one's own blood is called autologous transfusion, self-donated blood. Autologous transfusions also are prepared by salvaging blood loss during or immediately after surgery. The salvaged blood is suctioned, cleaned, and filtered from drainage collection devices. Clients who do not meet the time or health requirements for self-donation may select directed donors, blood donors chosen from among the client's relatives and friends. The client's siblings should not donate blood for this client. Doing so would rule them out as future organ or tissue donors for the client because antigens in the transfused blood would sensitize the recipient, increasing the risk for organ or tissue rejection. Also, a male sexual partner of a woman in her reproductive years should not be a directed donor to avoid possible antibiotic reactions against a fetus in any future pregnancy. Most authorities believe that receiving blood from directed donors is no safer than receiving blood from public donors. Although pre-donation of blood is available in the U.S., the criteria, criteria for autologous and directed donors may vary among regions and hospitals. Because directed donors must meet the same requirements as public donors, if the intended recipient does not use the blood, it is released to the public pool and can be given to someone else. Preoperative care. Although some pre-surgical activities take place weeks in advance, others cannot be performed until just before surgery. During the immediate preoperative period, the few hours before the procedure, Several major tasks must be completed, conducting a nursing assessment, providing preoperative teaching, performing methods of physical preparation, administering medications, assisting with psychosocial preparation, and completing the surgical checklist. Nursing assessment. Nurses share with physicians the responsibility for assessing preoperative clients. The assessment varies depending on the urgency of the surgery and if the client is admitted the same day of surgery or earlier. Although assessment of the surgical client is always necessary, the particular circumstances dictate the extent of the process. There may not be time to perform a detailed assessment. When surgery is not an emergency, the nurse performs a thorough history and physical exam. He or she assesses the client's understanding of the surgical procedure, post-operative expectations, and ability to participate in recovery. The nurse also considers cultural needs, specifically as they relate to beliefs about surgery, personal privacy, and presence of family members during the preoperative and postoperative phases. Clients from different cultures may experience differences in postoperative pain sensitivity and analgesic requirements. The nurse may question the client regarding strong culturally influenced feelings about disposal of body parts and blood transfusions. At admission, the nurse reviews preoperative instructions such as diet and fluid restrictions, bowel and skin preparations, and the withholding or self-administration of medications to ensure that the client has followed them. If the client has not carried out a specific portion of the instructions, the nurse immediately notifies the surgeon. The older person should be educated about taking or omitting usual medications before surgical procedures and about resuming usual or new medications after surgery. When asked, some clients do not realize the anticoagulant bleeding effect of the medications and supplements routinely taken. They include low-dose aspirin, which is an anticoagulant, cold and cough product use contains salicylates, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, increased GI bleeding, health supplements used for memory improvement such as ginkgo and ginseng are also anticoagulants. The nurse identifies the client's potential risk for complications during or after the surgery. Certain surgical risk factors increase the likelihood of perioperative complications. 
extremes of age, very young and very old, dehydration, malnutrition, obesity, smoking, diabetes, cardiopulmonary disease, drug and alcohol abuse, bleeding tendencies, low hemoglobin in red cells, and pregnancy. Some problems such as unexplained elevation in temperature, abnormal laboratory data, current infectious disease, or significant deviations in vital signs are causes for postponing or canceling the surgery. Preoperative teaching. Preoperative teaching varies with the type of surgery and the length of hospitalization. Preoperatively, clients are alert and free from pain or currently in less pain, which facilitates their participation. Knowledge of what to expect on the part of clients and family can enhance recovery from surgery. The following are examples of information to include in preoperative teaching. Preoperative medications when they are given and their effects. Postoperative pain control. Explanation and description of the post-anesthesia recovery room or post-surgical protocol. Discussion of the frequency of assessing vital signs and the use of monitoring equipment. The nurse also explains and demonstrates how to perform deep breathing, coughing, and leg exercises. Deep breathing, a form of controlled ventilation that opens and fills small air passages in the lungs, see chapter 21, is especially advantageous for clients who receive general anesthesia or who breathe shallowly after surgery because of pain. Deep breathing reduces the post-operative risk for respiratory complications such as atelectasis, which is airless, collapsed lung areas, and pneumonia, lung infection, both of which can lead to hypoxemia. The nurse practices deep breathing with clients before they undergo surgery, see figure 27-2. Deep breathing involves inhaling deeply, using the abdominal muscles, holding the breath for several seconds, and exhaling slowly. Pursing the lips may extend the period of exhalation. Incentive spirometers, incentive spirometers see chapter 21, are also used to promote deep breathing. Coughing. Thickened respiratory secretions often accompany impaired ventilation. Coughing is a natural method for clearing secretions from the airways. Deep breathing alone is sometimes sufficient to produce a natural cough. Forced coughing, coughing that is purposefully produced, may not be necessary for all post-op clients. Forced coughing is most appropriate for clients who have diminished or moist lung sounds or who raise thick sputum. Nevertheless, all clients need to be prepared for the possibility of having to perform this technique and should receive instructions about it. See Client and Family Teaching 27.1. Coughing is more painful for clients with abdominal or chest incisions. Administering pain medications approximately 30 minutes before coughing or splinting the incision during coughing can reduce discomfort. Method of splinting includes pressing on the incision with both hands, pressing on a, a pillow over the incision, or wrapping a bath blanket around the client. Leg exercises. Leg exercises help to promote circulation and reduce the risk for forming a thrombus, a stationary blood clot, in the veins. Blood clots form when venous circulation is sluggish and when the fluid compartment of blood is reduced. Surgical clients are predisposed to both. Surgical clients have reduced circulatory volume because of the preoperative restriction of food and fluids and blood loss during surgery. Also, blood tends to pool in the lower extremities because of the stationary position during surgery and the client's reluctance to move afterward. With the use of leg exercises, efforts to reduce circulatory complications begin as soon as the client recovers from anesthesia. Anti-embolism stockings are knee-high or thigh-high elastic stockings. They are sometimes called thromboembolic disorder hose, called TEDS, T-E-D. These stockings help to prevent thrombi and emboli. Emboli are mobile blood clots by compressing superficial veins and capillaries, redirecting more blood to larger and deeper veins where it flows more effectively toward the heart. Intermittent pneumatic compression devices discussed later are used for the same purpose but are applied postoperatively. Anti-embolism stockings must fit the client properly and must be applied correctly. See skill 27.1. Stockings that become dirty are laundered, during which a second pair stockings that become dirty are laundered during which a second pair is used. If washed by hand, the stockings are laid flat to dry to prevent loss of their elasticity.
client and family teaching, performing leg exercises. Sit with the head slightly raised, bend one knee, raise and hold the leg above the mattress for a few seconds. Straighten the raised leg, lower the leg back to the bed gradually. Do the same with the other leg. Rest both legs on the bed. Point the toes toward the mattress and then towards the head. Move both feet in clockwise and then counterclockwise circles. Repeat the exercises five times at least every two hours while awake. This is on page 614. Physical preparation. Depending on the time of admission to the hospital or a surgical facility, the nurse may perform some physical preparation that includes skin preparation, attention to elimination, restriction of food and fluids, care of valuables, putting on surgical attire, and disposition of prostheses. Skin preparation. Skin preparation involves cleansing the skin and in some cases hair removal because skin and hair are reservoirs for microorganisms. The goal is to decrease transient and resident bacteria without compromising skin integrity. Reducing bacteria helps to prevent postoperative wound infections. For planned surgery, the client may be asked to bathe or shower twice at home with 2% chlorhexidine gluconate for a minimum of two minutes contact time, dry with a fresh clean dry towel, and don clean clothing afterwards. The soap leaves a persistent antimicrobial film on the skin in preparation for surgery. Hair usually is not removed before surgery unless it is likely to interfere with the incision. Shaving causes microabrasions, tiny cuts that provide an entrance for microorganisms. For this reason, institutions are switching from razors to electric or battery-operated clippers for hair removal. Depilatory agents, chemicals that remove hair, are another alternative but their use is associated with skin irritation and allergic reactions. Some authorities believe that simply washing the skin and hair is sufficient to prevent infections. Elimination. The nurse may need to insert an indwelling urinary catheter preoperatively for some surgeries, particularly of the lower abdomen. A distended bladder increases the risk for bladder trauma and difficulty in performing the procedure. The catheter keeps the bladder empty during surgery. If a catheter is not inserted, the nurse instructs the client to urinate immediately before receiving preoperative medication. Enemas or laxatives may be ordered to clean the lower bowel if the client is having abdominal or pelvic surgery. A clean bowel allows for improved visualization of the surgical site and prevents trauma to the intestines or accidental contamination of the abdominal cavity with feces. A cleansing enema or laxative is prescribed the evening before surgery and may be repeated the morning of surgery. If bowel surgery is scheduled, intravenous antibiotics may be prescribed to destroy intestinal microorganisms. Food and fluids. The physician gives specific instructions about how long to restrict food and fluids preoperatively. Fasting from food and water from midnight onward before surgery is common, but the basis for the practice is not questionable. Fasting is used to reduce the potential for aspirating, also known as inhaling stomach contents, while a client is anesthetized. However, aspiration is uncommon today with standard practices used by those administering general anesthesia. Consequently, the American Society of Anesthesiology recommends that healthy preoperative clients can consume clear liquids two hours before elective surgery, have a light breakfast six hours before a surgical procedure, and eat a heavier meal six to eight hours beforehand. Despite these newer recommendations, old practices persist. The nurse therefore encourages clients to maintain good nutrition and hydration before the restricted time to promote nutrients such as protein and ascorbic acid, vitamin C, which are needed for healing. Despite current scientific evidence and recommendations that a healthy client can have clear liquids up to two hours prior to surgery, the old recommendation of nothing by mouth after midnight continues to persist in practice. Before any period of fluid restriction in older adults, it is important to assess vital signs, weight, and sternal skin turgor to establish a baseline for comparison. Valuables. The nurse instructs the client preoperatively to leave valuables at home. If the client forgets or does not follow this instruction, he or she must entrust valuables to a family member. Otherwise, healthcare agency personnel itemize them, place them in an envelope, and lock them in a designated area. The client signs a receipt and the nurse notes the item's whereabouts in the client's medical record. If the client is reluctant to move a wedding band, 
the nurse may slip a ribbon of gauze under the ring and then loop the gauze around the finger and wrist or apply adhesive tape around a plain wedding band. The client also removes eyeglasses and contact lenses, which the nurse places in a safe location or gives to a family member. Surgical attire. Usually clients wear a hospital gown and surgical cap to the operating room. The physician may order thigh-high or knee-high anti-embolism stockings or order the client's legs wrapped in elastic roller bandages before surgery to prevent venous stasis. See Chapter 28. Hair ornaments are removed to avoid injury with equipment used to administer oxygen and inhalant anesthetics. Makeup and nail polish are omitted to facilitate assessing oxygenation. If a client has acrylic nails, one usually is removed to attach a pulse oximeter which measures oxygen saturation. Dentures and prostheses. Depending on agency policy and the preference of the anesthesiologist or surgeon, the client removes full or partial dentures. Doing so prevents the dentures from causing airway obstruction during the administration of a general anesthetic. Some anesthesiologists prefer that well-fitting dentures remain in place to preserve facial contours, but that information must be communicated and well documented. When dentures are removed, they are placed in a denture container and stored at the client's bedside or with the client's belongings. Other prosthesis, such as artificial limbs, are also removed unless otherwise ordered. Older adults are, all, are likely to be self-conscious when dentures are removed before surgery. Collaboration with operating room personnel regarding the removal of dentures, eyeglasses, and hearing aids is helpful to ensure their use as much or as long as possible. Older adults who rely on eyeglasses or hearing aids may experience sensory deprivation if these aids are removed before surgery or other procedures. Removal may interfere with communication or contribute to confusion and altered mental status. Assure that dentures, eyeglasses, hearing aids are labeled with the person's name. Preoperative teaching topics, preoperative medications. The anesthesiologist or surgeon orders preoperative parental medications. Common preoperative medications include one or more of the following. Anti-anxiety drugs such as lorazepam, Ativan, reduce preoperative anxiety, cause slight sedation, slow motor activity, and promote the induction of anesthesia. Histamine 2 receptor antagonists such as cimetidine, tagamet, decrease gastric acidity and volume. Anticholinergics such as glycopyrrolate, called robinol, decrease respiratory secretions, dry mucous membranes, and prevent vagal nerve stimulation during endotracheal intubation. Neuromuscular blocking agents such as succin succinylcholine, which is anectine, promote skeletal muscle relaxation, relaxation during the procedure and allow for rapid intubation. Opioids such as fentanyl sedate and decrease the amount of anesthesia. Sedatives such as midazolam, which is Versed, promote sleep or amnesia and decrease anxiety. Antibiotics such as canamycin destroy enteric microorganisms. Before administering preoperative medications, the nurse uses at least two methods to verify the identity of the client. An example would be checking the client's identification bracelet and asking the client to state his or her name and date of birth. The nurse asks about drug allergies, obtains vital signs, asks the client to void, and ensures that the surgical consent form has been signed. Psychosocial preparation. Preparing the client emotionally and spiritually is as important as doing so physically. Psychosocial preparation should begin as soon as the client is aware that surgery is necessary. Anxiety and fear, if extreme, can affect a client's condition during and after surgery. Anxious clients have a poor response to surgery and are prone to complications. Many clients are fearful because they know little or nothing about what will happen before, during, and after surgery. Careful listening and explaining by the nurse about what will happen and what to expect can help to allay some of these fears and anxieties. The nurse also must assess methods the client uses for coping. Religious faith is a source of strength for many clients. Therefore, nurses question the client as part of the spiritual assessment, then facilitate contact with the client's clergy person or the hospital chaplain if requested. Preoperative checklist. A preoperative checklist, C27-4 on page 617, is a form that identifies the status of essential pre-surgical activities and is completed before surgery. The nurse verifies the following. 
The history and physical exam have been documented. The name of the procedure and the surgical consent form matches that scheduled in the operating room. The surgical consent form has been signed and witnessed. All lab and diagnostic test results, such as the fasting blood sugar or electrocardiogram, have been returned and reported if abnormal. Allergies have been identified. The client is wearing an identification bracelet and allergy bracelet, if any exist. The client has had nothing by mouth, nil per os, since midnight or the number of hours prescribed. Skin preparation, if required, has been completed. Vital signs have been assessed and recorded. Nail polish, glasses, contact lenses, and hairpins have been removed. Jewelry has been removed or the wedding ring has been secured. Dentures have been removed or left in place if requested by the person administering inhalant anesthesia. The client is wearing only a hospital gown and hair cover. The client has urinated. Location of intravenous site, type of solution, and rate of infusion are identified. The prescribed preoperative medication has been given. The nurse is responsible for completing and signing the checklist. Operating room personnel review it when they arrive to transport the client. Surgery may be delayed if the checklist is incomplete. Efforts have increased to ensure that the right client has the proper procedure at the correct site, if that applies. See Box 27-1 for the universal protocol developed by the Joint Commission to prevent errors in these categories. The Joint Commission Universal Protocol the purpose is to ensure that all the relevant documents and studies are available before the start of the procedure, that they have been reviewed, and that they are consistent with each other, with the client's expectations, and with the team's understanding of the intended client, procedure, site, and as applicable, any implants. Missing information or discrepancies must be addressed before starting the procedure. This universal protocol for preventing wrong site, wrong procedure, wrong person, surgery. Process, an ongoing process of information gathering and verification beginning with the determination to do the procedure, continuing through all settings and interventions involved in the preoperative preparation of the client up to and including the timeout just before the start of the procedure. Marking the operative site. Purpose, to identify unambiguously the intended site of incision or insertion. Process, for procedures involving right-left distinction, Multiple structures such as fingers and toes or multiple levels as in spinal procedures, the intended site must be marked such that the mark will be visible after the client has been prepped and draped. The person who knows the most about the client, usually the person performing the procedure, should mark the site before the procedure and, if possible, with the client involved. Time out immediately before starting the procedure. Purpose. To conduct a final verification of the correct client, correct procedure, correct site, and as applicable, correct um, implants. Process, active communication among all members of the surgical procedure team, consistently initiated by a designated member of the team, conducted in a fail-safe mode, that is the procedure is not started until any questions or concerns are resolved. Intraoperative period. The intraoperative period, the time during which the client undergoes surgery, takes place in the operating suite. It involves transportation to a receiving room, then to the operating room, where anesthesia is administered and the procedure is performed. The family is directed to a surgical waiting area during this time. Receiving room. The receiving room, a place in the surgery department where clients are observed until the operating room and surgical team are ready. In some hospitals, preoperative medication is administered when clients reach the receiving room rather than before leaving the nursing unit. This practice coordinates the client's sedation more closely with the actual time of surgery. Skin preparation may be delayed until this time as well. There is a direct relationship between the time the skin preparation is performed and the rate of microbial proliferation. Operating room. Eventually clients are taken to the operating room where their care and safety are in the hands of a team of experts, including physicians and nurses. Anesthesia is administered in the operating room. Various types of anesthesia cause partial or complete loss of sensation with or without a loss of consciousness. They include general, regional, and local anesthesia. General anesthesia acts on the central nervous system to produce a loss of sensation, reflexes, and consciousness. 
general anesthetics commonly are administered via inhaled gases or a drug like propofol, which is diprovan, intravenously. Throughout the duration of and recovery from anesthesia, the client is monitored closely for effective breathing and oxygenation, effective circulatory status, including blood pressure and pulse within normal ranges, effective temperature regulation, and adequate fluid balance. During weaning from the anesthetic at the end of surgery, the client's consciousness will be elevated sufficiently for him or her to follow commands and breathe independently. The recovery period can be brief or long. Many effects of general anesthesia take some time for the client to eliminate completely. Usually clients do not remember much about the initial recovery period. Regional anesthesia. Regional anesthesia interferes with the conduction of sensory and motor nerve impulses to a specific area of the body. The client experiences loss of sensation and decreased mobility to the specific anesthetized area. He or she does not lose consciousness. Depending on the surgery, the client may receive a sedative to promote relaxation and comfort during the procedure. Types of regional anesthesia include local and spinal anesthesia and epidural and peripheral nerve blocks. See figure 27.7. The major advantage of regional anesthesia is the decreased risk for respiratory, cardiac, and GI complications. Team members must monitor the clients for signs of allergic reactions, changes in vital signs, and toxic reactions. In addition, they must protect the anesthetized area if sensation is absent because the client is at risk for injury. Conscious sedation. Conscious sedation refers to a state in which clients are sedated and in a state of relaxation and emotional comfort, but are not unconscious. They are free of pain, fear, and anxiety and can tolerate unpleasant diagnostic and short therapeutic surgical procedures, such as endoscopies or bone marrow aspiration, while maintaining independent cardiorespiratory function. They can respond verbally and physically. The intravenous route is used to administer medications that create conscious sedation. If other routes are used, the client must have venous access for the treatment of possible adverse effects such as hypoxemia and central nervous system depression. The responsibility for ensuring client safety and comfort during sedation rests with the nurse directly. Although numerous types of equipment for monitoring clients are available, no equipment replaces a nurse's careful observations. Clients are discharged shortly after the procedure in which conscious sedation is used. Which postoperative complication is a protrusion of abdominal organs through separated wounds? Wound infection, ileus, dehiscence, or evisceration? Evisceration, a postoperative complication in which abdominal organs protrude through separated wounds is called evisceration. A wound infection indicates proliferation of pathogens or at or beneath the incision. An adynamic ileus signifies lack of bowel activity and dehiscence indicates the separation of incisional edges. Surgical waiting area. Reversal drugs. Medications that counteract the effects of those used for conscious sedation must be readily available in case the client becomes overly sedated. Two examples of reversal drugs are naloxone, Narcan, which is the antagonist for opiates like, opiates like morphine, and flumazenil, which is romazacon, which reverses anti-anxiety drugs like metazolam, which is called Versed. The surgical waiting area is the room where family and friends await information about the client. It is staffed by volunteers who provide comfort, support, and news about how the client's surgery is progressing. Many agencies provide food and beverages, public telephones, television, and magazines. Often the surgeon comes to the waiting area immediately after the procedure to contact the family. The family and surgeon generally go to a private room where the surgeon discusses the client's status and the procedure so as to ensure confidentiality. Post-operative period. The post-operative period begins after the operative procedure is completed and the client is transported to an area to recover from the anesthesia and ends when the client is discharged.
the post-anesthesia care unit called PACU, also known as the post-anesthesia reacting room, PAR, or the recovery room, is the area in which the surgical department where clients are intense, intensely monitored. Nurses in the PACU ensure the safe recovery of surgical clients from anesthesia. Immediate post-operative care. The focus of post-operative care, nursing care after surgery, is different during the immediate post-operative period than it is later when clients are more stable. The immediate post-operative period refers to the first 24 hours after surgery. During this time, nurses monitor the client for complications as he or she recovers from anesthesia and is sufficiently stable to be transferred to a nursing unit for continued assessment. Initial post-operative assessments. The circulating surgical nurse or anesthesiologist reports pertinent information regarding the surgery and the client's condition to the nurse in the PACU. Once the care of the client is transitioned to the recovery room nurse, the PACU nurse's major responsibilities are to ensure a patent airway, maintain adequate circulation, prevent or assist with the management of shock, maintain proper position and function of drains, tubes, and IVs, and detect evidence of any complications. The nurse systematically checks the following. Level of consciousness, vital signs, effectiveness of respirations, presence or need for oxygen, condition of the wound and dressing, location of drains and drainage characteristics, location type and rate of IV fluid, level of pain and need for analgesia, presence of a urinary catheter, and urine volume. Continuing postoperative care. Once the client is stable, the client is ready for transport to the general surgical unit where the client's room is prepared and assessments will continue to prevent, detect, or minimize complications. Preparing the room. The next stage of care begins with getting the client's bed and the environment ready. The nurses fold the top bed linen toward the foot or side of the bed. Preparing the room. The next stage of care begins with getting the client's bed and environment ready. The nurses fold the top bed linen toward the foot or side of the bed. They place the bed in a high position to facilitate transferring the client from the stretcher. Often they keep additional blankets ready for use because some clients feel cold after being quiet and inactive. Additionally, nurses assemble bedside supplies and equipment that facilitate caring for the client. Potentially useful items include oxygen equipment, a pole or electronic infusion device for con continuing the administration of IV fluids, an emesis basin if the client becomes nauseous, paper tissues, and a device for collecting and measuring urine. Suction canisters may be necessary for clients who have gastric tubes. Monitoring for complications. Postoperative clients are at risk for many complications, some of which are more likely to develop soon after surgery. Frequently focused assessments of the client and equipment facilitates a safe postoperative recovery. Complication, airway occlusion, which is obstruction of the throat. Tilt the head and lift the chin, insert an artificial airway. Hemorrhage, severe rapid blood loss, control bleeding, administer IV fluid, replace blood. Shock, inadequate blood flow. Place the client in a modified Trendelenburg position. Replace fluids, administer oxygen, give emergency drugs. Pulmonary embolus, obstruction of circulation through the lung as a result of a wedged blood clot that began as a thrombus. Give oxygen, administer anticoagulant drugs. Hypoxemia, inadequate oxygenation of blood. Give oxygen and treat the cause. A dynamic ileus, lack of bowel motility. Treat the cause, give nothing by mouth, insert an NG tube and connect to suction, administer IV fluids, and insert a catheter, or uh, administer IV fluids. Urinary retention, inability to void, insert a catheter. Wound infection, proliferation of pathogens at or beneath the incision. Cleanse with antimicrobial agents, open and drain the incision, administer antibiotics, reinforce wound edges. Dehiscence, separation, separation of incision, Reinforce wound edges and apply a, blind, a binder. Evisceration, protrusion of abdominal organs through separated wound. Cover with a wet dressing and reapproximate the wound. Providing food and fluids. 
The cardiac status of older adults is monitored carefully after surgery because they may not be able to tolerate or eliminate intravenous fluids given at a standard rate due to compromised cardiac or renal status. So providing food and oral fluids after surgery, the client needs to resume eating. Food and oral fluids are withheld until the surgical clients are awake, are free of nausea and vomiting, and bowel sounds are active. Postoperative clients usually progress from a clear liquid diet to more solid food unless complications develop. Nurses monitor fluid intake to ensure that the clients are adequately hydrated. The post-surgical diet may be progressed from clear liquids to a regular diet as tolerated. A quick progression to self-selected regular food by the second post-surgical meal is safe for most clients, even though those who have had major GI surgery and may even hasten recovery. If an indwelling catheter is inserted before surgery, it is best to remove it as soon as possible after surgery to prevent UTIs, urinary tract infections. Careful assessment of urination patterns and volume is indicated to ensure adequate voiding amounts and timing, especially if a bedpan will be required during a period of ambulatory restrictions. Promoting venous circulation. Surgical clients ambulate with assistance as soon as possible to reduce the potential for pulmonary and vascular complications. After some surgical procedures, however, anti-embolism stockings, leg exercises, ambulation, and elevation of the lower extremities may not be enough to reduce swelling of the lower extremities and the potential for thrombus formation. Muscle atrophy occurs in older adults who have been on bed rest for one or two days. Range of motion and muscle tone can be maintained through routine active or passive range of motion exercise. Consider requesting a referral for physical therapy for older adults who have been on bed rest. For clients who have the potential for impaired circulation in one or both extremities, a pneumatic compression device, a machine that promotes the circulation of venous blood and relocation of excess fluid into the lymphatic vessels may be medically prescribed. Various companies make pneumatic compression devices, but they all consist of an extremity sleeve with tubes that connect to an electrical air pump. See figure 27.9. The device compresses the sleeve extremity either in intermittently or sequentially from distal to proximal areas. Most devices cycle on for a few seconds and then cycle off for a longer period. Depending on the manufacturer, pumps may cycle one to four times per minute. The nurse is responsible for applying this device, skill 27.3. Other measures to prevent thrombi include drinking plenty of fluids, avoiding long periods of sitting, keeping the legs uncrossed, especially at the knees, ambulating and changing positions frequently. Preventing thrombus formation. Postoperatively, clients are at risk for developing deep vein thrombosis as a consequence of preoperative fluid restriction, a decrease in blood volume due to fluid loss during surgery, and decreased activity following the surgery. The nurse encourages leg exercises that were taught prior to surgery, early ambulation, and administers prophylactic, antithrombotic, medications as prescribed by the physician. Following major surgical procedures, a client typically receives an injectable anticoagulant such as deltaparin, which is called Fragmin, or Fondaparinex, which is Arixtra, to prevent thrombus formation. This medication supports standard nursing postoperative care and is not a substitute for ambulation or other activities to promote venous circulation. Performing wound management. Nurses assess the condition of the wound and the characteristics of drainage at least once a shift. Dressings are reinforced or changed if they become loose or saturated. Eventually, sutures or staples are removed. See Chapter 28. Most hospitalized clients are discharged within three to five days of surgery or sooner to continue their recuperation at home. Wound healing in older adults may occur slowly because of age-related skin changes and impaired circulation and oxygenation. Poor hydration and nutrition further interfere. A registered dietitian, dietitian can recommend nutritional interventions such as protein, zinc, and vitamin C to improve wound healing. If older adults develop postoperative infections, the manifestations are likely to be subtle or delayed. Older adults are likely to have a lower normal temperature. Therefore, it is imperative to document the client's usual baseline temp so that deviations can be assessed. A change in mental status may be an early indicator of infection. Providing discharge instructions. The nurse provides discharge instructions 
for managing self-care and medical follow-up before the client leaves. Common areas to address when discharging clients who have underground, underground surgery include the following. How to care for the incision site, signs of complications to report, what drugs to use to relieve the pain, how to self-administer prescribed drugs, when pre-surgical activity can be resumed, if and how much weight can be lifted, which foods to consume or avoid, when and where to return for a medical appointment. The nurse gives information verbally and in written form. A thorough assessment of an older client support system must be done before discharge. It should include the ability of the support system to provide assistance once the client has gone home. Support people should be included in discharge teaching with plenty of time to provide any return demonstration of learning regarding the needs of the older adult. Additionally, the home environment should be assessed before discharge for safety issues, such as scatter, rugs, lighting, rails, grab bars. If the older person could not manage his or her post-operative care independently or with assistance of supportive family or friends, options relative to extended or skilled nursing care should be explored and discussed. Skilled nursing or rehab therapists may be available from home care agencies and covered by health insurance for home settings. Is the following statement true or false? Anti-embolism stockings compress superficial veins and capillaries, redirecting more blood to larger and deeper veins where it flows more efficiently toward the heart. True. Anti-embolism stockings compress superficial veins and capillaries, redirecting more blood to larger and deeper veins where it flows more effectively toward the heart. Post-op care. Discharge instructions. Again, review how to care for the site of incision, signs of complications to report, which foods to consume or avoid, when and where to return for a medical appointment, what drugs to use to relieve pain, how to self-administer prescribed drugs, when pre-surgical activity can be resumed, if and how much weight can be lifted. General gerontologic considerations. Chronic health concerns in older clients may increase preoperative and postoperative periods. Muscle atrophy occurs in older adults who have been on bed rest as little as one or two days. Range of motion exercises can maintain mobility. Important to assess client support system for care at home. Client may need rehab services or extended care admission. Wound healing may occur more slowly due to impaired circulation and oxygenation, due to poor hydration and nutrition as well. Post-op signs and symptoms may be more subtle or delayed. Change in mental status may be an early indicator of infection. Cardiac status of older adults is monitored carefully after surgery. Possible nursing diagnoses for surgical clients, deficient knowledge, fear, acute pain, impaired skin integrity, risk for infection, risk for deficient fluid volume, ineffective breathing pattern, ineffective airway clearance, risk for impaired gas exchange, disturbed body image, and readiness for enhanced self-care. This is the end of the slideshow.